Well, we'll go ahead and start on time because this is a hybrid seminar and we've got uh, a number of people online uh, to come see our very special guest today, Dr. Ewan Burney. Um, welcome everyone to what we're calling a special seminar. This is a, a seminar of opportunity where we heard that Ewan would be in town and I saw a marketing opportunity to pitch our new Center for Genomics and Data Science Research, which I was appointed the director of uh, just this past January. I'm Adam Philippi. I've been at NHGRI in the intramural program for nine years, um, but we're kicking off this kind of inaugural year of the Center for Data Science and Genomic uh, Research. And the mission of this center uh, is really to think of the genome from a data-driven perspective, which is easy for me to do. I started my career as a computer programmer, and so I like to think about the genome kind of in terms of that analogy of thinking it uh, as code. And ultimately, and I think this is in line with the NHGRI, we aim to read, understand, and ultimately write genomic code uh, for the diagnosis and treatment of disease. But another important goal of our new center is to be basically horizontal across the institutes. And so if we think about institutes having disease focus or technology focus, this center has a data and a genomics focus where we're trying to develop and roll out technologies and methods that can apply widely to all of the other institutes' missions. And genome sequencing and genomics is just the poster child for this type of horizontal interactions because it's hard to think of an institute at the NIH that doesn't now come to rely on genomes and genomic information to help carry out their own missions. And so uh, it's with that in mind that I'm obviously thrilled to welcome our inaugural seminar speaker, Dr. Ewan Burney, because um, I think Ewan is the embodiment of a scientist that's cross-disciplinary like that and bringing together molecular biology, computer science, maths <laughs> um, to do interdisciplinary genomic science. And he's been really at the forefront of genomics throughout his career, um, going all the way back to analyzing the gene set in the initial Human Gene Project and came to know Eric and Francis very well during that time, to being a key leader in the ENCODE Project, which was an early attempt to understand what we had just read in the human genome, and to his current position now of being the director of the absolutely essential uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, EBI. Um, which I know many of you probably rely on for your day-to-day -day tasks. Among his scientific accomplishments, he has, in the true British way, a number of letters after his name and a number of honors, which includes a fellow of the Royal Society, which is where this picture was taken from. Ewan claims this is 10 years ago and a few less gray hairs. He's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and a commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire which I understand is one notch below night. So nice to know you're leaving some room for improvement <laughs> in your future career. But what I love most about Ewan is that despite all of the, the British pomp, uh, he is one of us. And what do I mean by that? I mean, he's a true data geek <laughs> in the truest sense. And if you're in bioinformatics, you will certainly have interacted with his work uh, from the early days of GeneWise and Exonerate um, to the Genome Assembly folks in the late 2000s leading the development of the Velvet Assembler and the de Brown graph craze of short reads uh, to modern data formats like CRAM. And the resources, importantly, that he helped build and now maintains at EBI, including PFAM, Ensemble, ENA, um, and many more. You will be very hard pressed to find anyone who knows his stuff across more disciplines than Ewan, and it's his curiosity and enthusiasm that just makes him a joy to host and to talk to um, and to just brainstorm with. So, Please join me in welcoming you into the NIH today as he helps inaugurate our Center for Genomics and Data Science Research with what sounds like a pretty geeky title, AI Genetics, Fish and Human, A Story in Two X. Right. Uh, gosh, I really don't know that I can live up to all of this. Um, so uh, I, uh, this, this is going to be, uh, as ever, I've, I've put quite a lot in. Um, and I've got two stories. Uh, one story went from inception to preprint in about 10 months. And one story has gone from inception and it's still not quite preprinted for 15 years. And I will tell you which one's which. One involves animals, the other one doesn't. Um, uh, and I want to get both of them uh, across to you. So this is actually a very old story which is how do we think about phenotype 
and genotype and the relationship between the two of them. The picture on the left here is the Mouse House in Boston. In Cambridge, uh, they did earwig genetics and weird plant genetics. In Boston, they did mice. In um, uh, California, they did fruit flies. And I'll come on to Japan, they did medaka fish. And it was a heyday then in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s of realizing that there was something, they didn't know it was DNA, that was being passed down between generations. And you could associate that with the phenotypes that you saw in these animals. And this question is incredibly relevant today. This is from my colleague, uh, Peter Donnelly, <coughs> with his best uh, risk score for breast cancer. Um, the blue line here is the average risk for women in the UK biobank. The red is the top 3% of risk. And the uh, uh, green is the bottom 3%. And one of the questions here is, is uh, I mean, this looks like a very compelling chart for starters. Um, and then one of the questions that you should ask yourself immediately is, how do we know that that chart is right? Can we use it? Uh, what is the error bars, this little shaded error bar, doing uh, in this chart? So it's a very old question. Um, and we have long said that phenotype is some function of the genotype and the environment. And back in the 1930s, the very simplest way of handling that is you think about those terms as variables and you add them together. This was the foundation of frequentist statistics by R.A. Fisher. Um, it's a bedrock of not only our own field, but it's a bedrock of frequentist statistics uh, uh, from this. But actually, there's no reason why that functional form has to be correct. Uh, there can be many, many different things you could imagine going on. And some of them, we give them names. So when we think about interactions between two bits of the genotype in a population, and it's changing the interaction, is changing the phenotype, we call that epistasis. When we think about the interaction between genotype and the environment, we call that uh, gene-environment interactions. And actually, there's a third one, which is how the complex environmental exposures that we have give rise to the phenotypes that we um, uh, exist as, as animals, as individuals. Complex causal pathways of environmental effects. And actually, I'm going to start on that last one, uh, not the first second. The second act will be about genetics. The first act is not going to have any genetics in it at all, no DNA. So this is a very simple question for humans. How do we model the complex life course that humans go through? Um, uh, we all know, and we have these amazing systems called hospitals and medical systems, which record many important life events in our trajectory in health. How on earth do we think about those um, in some kind of framework? So this is the preprint. I encourage you to go there. Just to say, my group, which is uh, myself, Tom Fitzgerald, Kumar, we are the kind of uh, battle-scarred data scientists, and we're on a steep learning curve with AI. Uh, Moritz Gerstung, longtime collaborator, and Artem, the first author here, are the AI wizards who know their way around um, a complex neural network uh, for this. So this observation came about when we were thinking about healthcare in Denmark. And Moritz, actually with my postdoc Kumar, realized that there was a real analogy here between the way we think about language. And so here is the way um, large language models think about language. They tokenize the language. And the task you give the AI business is you, sh you mask maybe from the onwards. And you say to the uh, AI system, or lazy onwards, please predict the next word. And amazingly, if you have a big enough network, not only does that predict a reasonable word, it produces complete sentences that you seemingly can chat to. Of course, that's not what the AI machine is doing. The AI machine is just predicting the next word given a prompt. Healthcare looks very similar, actually. We have a series uh, of tokens, uh, events, um, uh, ordered tokens. But there's one thing which is very, very different between healthcare and language. And it's the fact that those tokens do not, uh, healthcare comes with variable time, heterogeneous time. And so 
by the way, if you, you can do this if you want. If you just put all your health tech tokens into a large language model, um, the large language model is convinced it's doing something right, does it with tremendous confidence, it produces absolute rubbish uh, at the uh, uh, next time round when you ask it to predict. And so the major thing we have to model here is this heterogeneous time. In other words, in this example, there was a very big gap between asthma and diabetes, and that is very meaningful uh, for this person's trajectory. So Artem and Moritz added a number of things into the classic generalized pre-trained transformer, GPT. This is like chat GPT fame, uh, where you take one of these neural networks and you, uh, the task you're going to set it is to predict the next token. But now we add an extra head for prediction. So not only do you predict the next token, but we also predict the time for the next token. And then there's some other little subtleties here. We have to present age to the model. And so we present age into the model as a separate uh, kind of almost stream track on, on everything. And then an interesting feature of healthcare, certainly in the UK and Denmark, which I'll come on to, is healthcare events are only recorded at the granularity of one day. And so uh, in a single day, you may have four events, and there is no ordering of those four events. Now, this is actually quite important. Um, so if it says, um, you know, stroke, then sepsis, that's the same as sepsis, then stroke. An important thing is death. On the day you die, there's a lot of other diagnoses that happens on the, that very same day. The first time we ran this, we discovered that the model was convinced that death was very predictive of the future, which we thought was incredibly counterintuitive. Now, you can fix that by just forcing death to go to the end. Uh, the deeper problem than that fix is this business of, of exchangeability uh, within a day. And so that was a very important thing to fix. The final thing, which is sort of fascinating for me, Actually, the, the GPT architecture, which looks very, very clean, um, it's, it's sort of hyper, it's subtly tuned to language. And so in that case where the lazy, um, you know, the, the dog chased the rabbit, the uh, the token space might favor rabbit, mouse, hare, or anything that a dog chases, but the model favors the last noun, the last word that fits the token space very carefully. Now, actually, this is the opposite of Rain Ryan for healthcare, by the way. Um, many, in many systems, you will, you will code your subsequent heart attack after your first heart attack gets a different code. And so, actually, healthcare deliberately does not repeat because it makes a difference, it makes a distinction between the first incidents of a, of a thing versus the ongoing incidences. And so there's quite a lot of fiddling around to get this to work. Now, I don't have time. Um, I'm afraid if you're an AI geek, I recommend you read the paper. We do hyperparameter scans. We do it all correctly. We look at, get all of that right. I'm going to speak here to the people who I think kind of just like, they're going to trust me. So trust me that principally Artem and Moritz did the right thing with us. And I'm going to give you the results. So these are my favorite types of humans. Um, on the left-hand side is UK Biobank, half a million Brits. They include both of my parents. Uh, they've been tracked by the NHS since 1992. And they have given a self-reported survey of their um, health events before 1992. And then another great set of humans are Denmark. You, if you ask nicely and you have a very good reason and you get approved, you can get access to 10 million Danish records. Um, in this case, uh, for this study, we got access to only 1.9 million Danish records. Their, their kind of year zero is 1977, so all of their healthcare events since 1977 are recorded, and you can get access to them. So we do the classic business of very, very carefully separating out valid two validation data sets. We train only on 80% of the UK biobank. I just want to stress the entirety of Denmark is our zero shot test set. So we are going to test it on Danish data with no change in parameters at the end of the day. 
So it's quite difficult to, um, uh, this is the way we think about the model. It's a very good representation of this. So let me just talk you through this. These are six diseases, sorry, eight diseases, including death at the end here. There's breast cancer, here's septicemia, chickenpox, and other things. So what's being plotted here on the um, x-axis is age in years. On the y-axis is the rate, and that's both the population rate, and when we come to the individuals, it's the prediction of the instantaneous rate of this being the next token. What's being plotted here are the population rates of these diseases, and females are in dark purple and males are in teal. So breast cancer, you can see females have a much, much higher rate of breast cancer than males. You can see here that depressive episodes have a very different shape. It kind of kicks in in your 20s. Um, death, uh, by the way, the UK Bar Bank was recruited by as healthy volunteers at the age of 40. And so no one in this data set has died before the age of 40, by definition. Uh, um, uh, and you can see that that takes off um, in later life. Now, the cloud of points, which you can see, the kind of gray points, is a sampling of all 400,000 different individuals, we could put every individual at every time point, but it would be obviously too hard to render. Um, and it's the probability that our model, the rate that our model predicts for this particular event. And what you can probably not see in this resolution is that the, that cloud goes around these population um, uh, levels. The ones in the dark, um, uh, the heavier color is the event just before the event where it really happened. So for the individuals that really had this event, we look at the risk that our model predicts the event before that event. So from this perspective, what's important to notice, let's see here in death, that for the people who die, um, our model thinks that they are more likely to die than the population average on the event before they die. Now, we can quantify this uh, in a moment in um, area under the curve charts. Um, you can see here in breast cancer, there's a bunch of women who get breast cancer where we can't really shift the, the, the risk. But we have a little cloud at the top of women where the model is really quite confident that they're going to get breast cancer. Um, I'll come on to why the model is confident. This one is very interesting. Here is chickenpox. It has a very strong, uh, there's no vaccination for chickenpox in the UK. Um, and there's a very strong peak in early life for chickenpox. And actually, the models over predict, or from the perspective of the data, the rates for the people who, who get this. The, the, we we kind of go, it's. Um, it, the model actually thinks pretty much everyone should get chickenpox in early life, which of course they do, they just don't report it. So that is eight diseases. This model simultaneously models all 1,261 ICD-10 codes at the same time. And this is plotting now for each one of these diseases. We can plot the area under the curve. Um, which is the receiver operator characteristics. It's one of the ways of characterizing how good your prediction is. One means you're almost perfect. Um, 0.5 means you're random. And this is for all those um, uh, 1,261 diseases. And you can see that we get AUCs sometimes which are very high. Now, this is kind of cheating, or it's it's ignoring a very obvious thing, which is age and sex are really, really big factors in whether you get a particular disease or not. And so this is the change of our AUC by our prediction versus a very simple age-sex model, a Cox proportional hazards age-sex model. So we just fit the age-sex model to this. And again, you can see here that we do, now we're doing the deltas, so zero means when we're above zero, we're doing better than an age sex model, and nearly for every disease, we're doing better than an age sex model, and in some cases, we're doing much better. Now, that holds up. This is in the validation data set for the UK, so it's actually not seen, this data, but of course, it's UK data, a UK model, a model trained in the UK, tested in UK. 
we did all of this as well on the Danish data set without changing the parameters. Now this is kind of impressive that it just works, basically. Um, it says that the doctors in Denmark are putting in ICD-10 codes in pretty much the same way as the doctors in the UK, which you might question whether they were doing that or not. Um, and you can see that, again, our AUCs now in this 1.9 million data sets are very big, and the baseline is good. If you're careful, people will notice that we're not so good at cancer. There's a long, complicated story about cancer registry update times behind this. So we don't think that that's a biological thing. We think that's a technical thing. Now, you, depending on your perspective, you might go either, you, most people come with two perspectives. They either go, oh my god, this is amazing. You know, can you predict when I'm going to die sort of thing the AI machine is going to do? Or if you're an epidemiologist, you're probably like, ooh, I bet they messed something up. And uh, uh, um, uh, I bet they've done something wrong somewhere. If you're those epidemiologists, please read our paper. We explore our biases and our other components. And we do some other tests to convince ourselves, and I hopefully you, that we haven't messed anything up. What is true is that we learn all the biases in the data sets. And the biggest bias is that uh, the UK Biobank was recruited as healthy volunteers between the ages of 40 and 60. And therefore, no one dies in this model's world before 40. They ref our model refuses to let people die before the age of 40, which is obviously unrealistic. But we are pretty confident that if we trained this on a full data set that was well ascertained, we had the right ascertainment that matched the, the study population, we would not get those biases. This is one way of comparing, in this case, against three different um, scores in black for cardiovascular, for dementia, and for death. And this is the uh, famous uh, Framingham risk score, the UK dementia risk score that's used in UK dementia clinics. And this is the Charlson index, which is often used in hospitals, I believe, here and in the US. So these are clinical scores that are used in practice now. And um, we've separated this out by time. Um, so by looking at the horizon where you try to predict to, one month ahead, three months, six months, 12 months, 24. So the black is the current clinical scores, and the blue is Delphi. So you can see we're pretty much the same as the current clinical scores. For UK, for the dementia, we're almost indistinguishable. We're actually significantly better for death. And there's something interesting about that, because death is a very multi-pathway process. There isn't one pathway to death. And so we think that that's, again, a true feature of our model. Uh, but hopefully, this will give you more reassurance. This is now just three of the 1,261 diseases that we looked at. Now, why am I, you might, again, so if you're a kind of healthcare person, you're like, this is kind of amazing. Can we roll this out? Can we do some other things? Of course, this needs, A, to be trained on the correct data set. The UK Biobank is not the correct data set. B, a lot of skeptical epidemiologists are going to have to crawl all over this and, like, hit the, hit the tires and, you know, complain about it and, and test it in a variety of different ways. And then even if you were going to use it, you would have to think about how would you use it. So in other words, the thing that is the most predictable, such as death, almost certainly these, this very good prediction of death, are all of these diagnoses that happen in a hospital when you're very close to death, so sepsis and some other things. So I, that death prediction actually may not be that useful for, for a practicing clinician, whereas other predictions where we're statistically less good might be far more useful um, for a practicing clinician. But what is really interesting is that these models have an internal space. So the models to make these predictions have an internal space which they map every person at every time to. In our case, for our model, it was one, a 120-dimensional space. The AI term for this is embedding. You're allowed to use the word space, latent space, and embedding. 
interchangeably. It took me a year to discover that. Um, uh, and this is a projection of that 120 dimensional space, looking at it from the perspective of ICD 10 codes. So obviously we can't get 120 dimensions onto two dimensions. And so this is, I wince when I say this, this is a UMAP projection. So do not overread anything in this projection. But things that are nearby are meaningful in UMAPs. So there's a cluster up here, which are diabetes-related conditions. There's a cluster up here about um, uh, uh, female reproductive uh, conditions and cancers. And there's a cluster down here uh, with the black dot being death which are this cluster of diagnoses that happen when you're in a hospital just before you die. Now, the interesting thing about this space is, of course, the model did not know about anything about the hierarchies, did, did not know any of the meanings of, of these, uh, these codes. This space was created by the model to be able to predict humans in their healthcare system. And so I can put humans now at any point in their life in a 100, 120, well, Brits, let me be more specific, Brits or Danes, I could put Brits and Danes into a 120 dimensional space at any point in their life. And that space is the same space to neighboring humans or other humans in the system. So it's a way of representing their life course up to now. So this is one example of the sort of sophisticated modeling that is now accessible to us. But I'm now going to move to my act two, which is how on earth do we know that this modeling and these other things are right? And I'm going to switch to a different part of the problem, but I would like to loop back the two pieces. So again, my overarching question that the phenotype is some function of genotype and environment um, again, we often do this business where we approximate it as some sum, but we have these other components. And now I'm going to focus on these two, epistasis and gene by environment. And what it was very frustrating for me is that I would, as a human geneticist, was very, very happy with the additive model because it made discoveries. But then myself, as someone who hangs out with model organism geneticists and farm animal breeders, knew that this additive model was clearly inadequate in many, many situations. There were many situations in plant breeding, in animal breeding, and in model organism genetics where simply summing all the terms did not make sense. And um, you could have a bar argument about this. And these are the arguments about why you might think the linear model is right. And these are the arguments why you might think they're wrong. And it was extremely frustrating for me because you could never resolve this argument. You were never in a position to actually ask what was the impact of the way we model phenotypes currently as additive combinations um, uh, in human genetics. And what became very clear is that we need to have an organism where we're able to both vary and control the genetics of that organism and where we are able to vary and control the environment of that organism. So we need to have an organism where we, can, we have full control over the system. That organism is not humans, sadly. Um, there's many, many reasons why it's not humans. Uh, but humans are out uh, for this question. So I want to introduce this rather lovely fish, Japanese rice paddy fish. As I said, right back in the 1930s, the 1910s, in fact, this was the fruit fly equivalent in Japan. And the geneticists in Japan used this organism to discover and understand genetics at the time. One of the interesting things, this organism is a perfectly good organism. Um, I am, I'm pro-medaka fish. That does not mean I'm anti-zebra fish or anti-mouse or anti-rat. I'm just pro-medaka. Uh, um, uh, it is a very good model organism. It has quite a small genome breeds very nicely. Um, uh, it has good genetics. It's got a heterogametic, very good heterogametic sex system. And interestingly, it is the only vertebrate where there is a protocol for inbreeding from the wild. 
Now, I'm not going to try and work out why this is, by the way. Okay? I, mean, I don't want to understand why this is. I just want to exploit this fact. So what we did from this one place, sorry, I should go back, this one place in Japan, Kyoso, is we made a set of inbred lines from the wild. So this is like taking Framingham, that little town in Massachusetts, and now every individual is a kind of set of identical twins. We can reproduce Framingham as many times as we like in as many environments as we like experimentally. Of course, it's like a little fishy Framingham. It's not humans. But think of it as Framingham that I'm allowed to redo many, many times. So um, we've just finished. It took, it took me much longer, well, not me, my colleagues, much longer to inbreed them, sequence them, get the phenotyping up, everything else. So we've just finished um, our first phenotyping round. For many practical reasons, um, this is our go-to phenotype. It's a bit like, just as humans, the easiest thing to measure is height. This heartbeat is the easiest thing to measure in Madaka fish. So we can very easily measure this phenotype. The, um, uh, what we did then is we can do this in 96 well plates. We can fully automate it, the readout of the phenotypes. And then my colleague, Bettina Welts, uh, a student of Jochen Whitbrot, she measured all 80 lines. That's the x-axis here. And she measured many embryos from each line, hence the box plots, at three temperatures, 21, 28, and 35. And Bettina has ordered the lines by the average heart rate at 28. So that's why this one's low and this one's high. So first off, you can see there is a difference in genetics. This line has a slower heart rate than this line over here, and it is reproducible when I take multiple embryos. The next thing is the 35 and 21 is not always ordered by 28. And you can see that this, these lines are much less smooth. In other words, the response, the change in heart rate by temperature is different line by line. So we have a G by E effect by this. Now, unfortunately, this is only 80 lines. If you're a geneticist, you'll know you're in deep trouble uh, of, of finding the locus with only 80 lines from the wild. Uh, you would need many, many more wild cases. So, uh, but they're inbred lines. So we are allowed to design our own um, uh, genetics experiment. And so in this case, we did not just one F2 cross. We did quite a complex multi-way F2 cross inspired by plant breeders. And this is, uh, a, we look at extremes in the phenotype, but both the absolute rate and the temperature response. So this line over here, so this line over here has a very, very different temperature response than the other lines, for example. And this is showing just that the F2's distributions of phenotypes lie between the two um, uh, F0s. Classic, it's like Mendel's P's. So my student took this data. Um, we did light genome shotgun. We imputed the genotypes. And we did an association study. So just like a, a human GWAS, though it's a cross, so we're using a linear mix model. I'm just showing here the association on, on for 21 degrees centigrade. And you can see we have some very, very credible large peaks um, uh, of, of genetics here. Just to show the other temperatures, um, these, this number goes up to 80. This number goes up to 150. And that's because there is a honking great big peak on chromosome 15, which is absolutely massive. Uh, in fact, if you zoom in, you do get little peaks down here as well, just as you did on 21. That peak is completely absent on, on 21 degrees. So this is a very big G by E effect. So just to go through this, some peaks we get in all cases. Here, Bettina is just doing presence absent in the GWAS. This is not the right way to do it. Statistically, I will do it better in a moment. But just to get you a sense of the data, um, this is a peak which we only see in 28 and 35 and not in 21. 
And then here's actually the box plots behind this. For the top snip here, plotting the uh, readout at 21 degrees, 28, and at 35 for the three genotypes here. And you can see that the AA genotype has a radically different behavior at 35 degrees, whereas the AA genotype at 21 shows no effect. So a very, very strong, very obvious G by E effect. Because this is an experimental animal, we can go in and test this. And for five of our peaks, we had a credible candidate gene by a variety of techniques. Uh, mainly, there's a stop codon in one of the genes, which is kind of obvious to go off and test. And so for these cases, we can make CRISPR results. I'm going to just show you a couple. So this is one on chromosome 15 showing that knockout. And indeed, we get a massive change by that knockout. Here is a different one on chromosome 21 where the, the, um, uh, it, uh, the, the CRISPR variant actually increases the heart rate. And you can see across a number of lines, we get that. If, you're, if you notice, there's some lines where you don't get so much effect, some backgrounds we don't get so much effect, and some where we get a much bigger effect. And we actually have done quite a lot of follow-up biology, which I don't have time to talk about um, for this. Um, but they express in the, the heart, uh, for example, some they express in the brain. <clears throat> but I'm interested in a much more kind of more statistical question, which is to what extent do we mislead ourselves by using an inappropriate statistical model, that additive statistical model? So just to say, our most sophisticated model that we're going to use has uh, genetics, temperature. D is a dominance term, so the dominance for dominant recessive terms. And then two interaction terms, one the interaction of temperature with genetics and one with this dominance term. And the minimal model, this is the model that most human geneticists would use if they did GMAS. So this now fits um, where we can do a statistical test about which um, models fit the best. Temperature is a really big effect. And unsurprisingly, no model fits just the genotype by itself. That's no surprise. Um, that no model likes that. Every, but every model needs to have the environment temperature in there. Um, only six loci fit the model we normally use in human genetics. So only six loci fit the additive model, whereas there's another uh, 10 loci that have some kind of nonlinear effect, either a dominance term or a G by E term, G by T term temperature or G by E by T. Now, you could say this chromosome 15 locus, it's a bit weird. It's really big. It's almost like a rare disease locus rather than a, than a kind of weak uh, locus. It's kind of interesting question about why did we find it. We can see this locus in the wild population. So it definitely segregates in the wild population. Um, so it's not, it's not so rare that it's just popped out in this one individual. Um, by the way, it's robust whether we include, whether we model this out as a covariate or we even just drop all the crosses that don't have uh, this, uh, that have, sorry, have this variant. A couple of interesting things. Um, we see a touch of overdominance um, in, and this is our strongest overdominance case. So if you're a plant or animal breeder, you'll have met overdominance. This is called hybrid vigor or heteresis, where the cross progeny is better than either of the two parents. Now, human geneticists don't think this happens much in humans. They're just like, nah, we're not going to model this. Um, and you can see here, for this, in this cross here, 7268 cross for this locus, you can see that this het, it does look different. It does look above both of the homozygotes. So the heterozygote is somehow out of bounds from the homozygotes. And that's a good example of a nonlinear effect. And I'm afraid I don't have time to talk about our trans G by G, our epistasis, classic epistasis. But the one thing I would say 
is that we see a lot of epistasis which is environmentally specific. So it's G by G by E. The epistasis only comes out in a particular environment. The epistasis is not there across the whole of the environments. And again, this is our, our one of the examples where this particular environment in this particular back, um, uh, other genotype on chromosome 11, this chromosome 21 QTL is very obvious. But if I move the environment here, or if I move to this other um, chromosomal, the other locus environment, it disappears. If anything, it's going the other way. So we do see these G by G cases. Now, if you're a human geneticist, you might say to yourself, that's fine, Ewan. I've always accepted that there are G by G effects and G by E effects. I don't care, because I've got lots and lots of people in my cohort. And I'm just interested in discovering biology, not trying to statistically model things. And so that's actually what's a hard question to come back to there is, well, I wonder what we're missing. I wonder what things can we not find, no matter how many people we throw at the problem. Are we always guaranteed to find things? So we set up now, having done this assessment, we could take our most sophisticated model and simulate using, in fact, real data, real temperature data. So this is the, the temperatures that wild medarca fish experience uh, as they grow up as eggs. And we could have a simulation where we knew the right answer. And in that simulation, we could then ask a discovery problem. So this discovery problem is for and a, a genotype with a particular allele frequency. So this is 0.5, and it goes out to 1 in 1,000. And then um, in this case, we're going to use a discovery model, which was the same as our simulated model. And what I'm plotting is the sample size needed to get to 5 times 10 to the minus 8 p-value. Do not ask human geneticists why we trust 5 times 10 to the minus 8. We just do. Uh, so that is the magic number uh, to hit. So when I, unsurprisingly, use the model for discovery, which is the same as the model for simulation, that you could actually solve this analytically, and this is the, pretty much the curve you would get. But now, because it's a simulation, I can use inappropriate models. I can use, I can use models for discovery, which were not the model for simulation, and I can ask, do I, how many people do I need to make a discovery? And actually, for this locus, if I use these models, pretty much the same number of people. It fits all the time. Now, if, I'm, if I imagine there was a situation where I didn't know about temperature, where I had no temperature reading, how many fish would I need to make a discovery? Well, now I need a lot more. Uh, and that's the black line. But that goes. Uh, actually, for something like UK Biobank uh, or FinGen, that's half a million people. Actually, this locus is discoverable for an appreciable amount of allele space. It's discoverable. Now, what's even more interesting in this simulation situation, we can now model what happens if I have a bad measure of the environment. What if I can only measure the environment, but I add some variance into that measure? And these are two types of variant, two levels of variance that we've added in this environmental noise. So I've shown this, built this up here for chromosome four, one of our 16 loci. This now is for all the loci. And I'm going to think about trying to find 1%, allele frequencies of 1%. So the question is can I find things at an allele frequency of 1%? So by the way, if I don't model the environment, I can't find anything. So if I, if, I, if I somehow did not know about the environment, that's it. I'm out of power. There were two loci that I can't find with a linear model, um, no matter what I do. I have to have a more sophisticated model. And then there's a bunch of other loci where um, if I have an environmental variance of less than 10%, I can find it. But if it's more than 
I can't find it. So this is a glass half empty, glass half full situation for human geneticists. Sample size will get you a long way as long as you have some measure of the environment of interest. You must have some measure of the environment of interest. You can actually get away with a non-interaction model for most loci. Two, so out of the 16 loci, you could get away with a linear model for 14 out of 16 of the loci at a reasonable frequency. Um, but you're, you are going to leave those on the table, uh, those two loci. Now, when I first saw this plot here in the necklace, this plot here, I thought this was a bug. I saw Saul, I literally said, Saul, you've got a bug in your code. Could you go fix it? There's no way that that should happen like that. And he came back and he said, no, 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 it's not a bug. And in fact, this, if you remember, was the chromosome 5, was the overdominance locus. So the locus where the heterozygote went outside of the homozygotes. Now, if you fit this with a linear model, if the allele frequency is high, the second homozygote is the rare homozygote is present, and you fit a slope including it. If the allele frequency is low, you basically only have heterozygotes. You actually fit a line in the opposite direction. Slightly amazingly, your effect size flips for this. And there is a magic allele frequency where no matter how many people you have, you will never find this locus with a linear model. Now, this, you know, I say this, when I say this model algorithms and genetics farm breeder genetics, I'm like, no shit, yeah. You know, we've known this for 25 years, uh, or even longer, 50 years. You know, this is old hat. Um, but I don't think my human geneticist colleagues have totally got this uh, in their head. And um, it's interesting to think about it. So um, I'm afraid I didn't put a summary slide in. But what I would like you to get out of these two stories is that we, are, we have increasingly sophisticated statistical machine learning and AI methods to understand life. And I gave you an example in the first time. But whenever we bring these statistical models to bear, on humans, we have to remember that we really can't control humans. We have to, we can only observe. And therefore, we can never, although we can test generalization, we can never actually test whether the models that we produce are reasonable and whether the models, what the models will leave behind. And so it's a huge benefit. There's two reasons, I think, that model organism biology should continue to flourish. So one is one of the reasons that many, many people go to it. It is a way of us unpicking mechanism and proving mechanism in an incredibly detailed and precise way. But the other reason to do it is to understand what we're actually doing when we do these observational studies in humans too much we rely that the statistical models we have are adequate or reasonable or will be doing the right things without being able to test them um, thoroughly. So um, many people to thank. Um, in particular, this is really the fish work, um, uh, which is with Jochen Whitbrot, uh, Kiyoshi Nagai, and Felix Loosley. This is my team. And for the human work, I don't have a picture of Moritz, but I need to put him in and Artem from DKFZ, and Kumar and Tom. Uh, there's Tom. Kumar didn't come to this uh, retreat, uh, um, uh, did the human work. So thank you very much for listening. Be the, be the voice of Zoom. Huh? We have nearly 200 people on Zoom, so okay, that's hybrid good. seminars are nice because we can exceed the capacity of this room. Um, first question on the first story from anonymous attendee. <laughs> uh, I'll paraphrase. Um, they're asking um, if these models can predict a disease or an outcome far enough in advance that you could have some kind of intervention. And have you? Yes. So we, we again, I commend the preprint. Um, 
basically, we think we've got information going out the kind of horizon to the point where where the information at a point in time decays is about five years. Obviously, nearer events are much better to predict. And something which I should stress, just like in language, in language there's two things. There's kind of content and there's grammar. So grammar as in, you know, the sentence structure goes this way, you know, noun, verb, noun, or whatever it is. And then content, actually what's going on in the sentence. Healthcare is very similar. And these diagnostic pathways, I think of it as healthcare grammar. So a classic is in diabetes in the UK, you come in with crazy glucose, pretty much all the time you get a code that says um, unspecified or uncertain uh, diabetics or uncertain glucose uh, metabolism error. And then two months later, you will either get a type 2 diabetes call or a type 1 diabetes call or sometimes be left in that bucket. And so predicting type 2 diabetes ends up being a really easy task because you look back two months, you say, well, was the last thing recently uh, one of those? And then age and BMI and other things. So if you look at our type 2 diabetes call on a short basis, the AUCs are brilliant. And that's why we have to think about this time basis quite a lot. So we have to, I mean, the model is doing the right thing. It's modeling exactly the right thing. I, I don't think we should ding the model for doing this. Um, but we have to be aware when we're using the model that that healthcare diagnostic process is, is sort of something that ideally we'd like to put into a different bucket. And we really want risk, which is the, in a language equivalence, the moral equivalent of content rather than grammar. Yeah. Uh, that was a wonderful talk and brought up tons of questions. One thing I admit I don't understand as a dopey human geneticist, we mentioned some issues if there was a certain amount of variance in the environmental data in your, so what would, what should we expect about how much variance there might yeah. be in these data sets and how do we deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think, it's, I think, you know, again, in these situations where we control everything, we can, you know, artificially add variants. We literally can change things to our own thing. So we can, we can uh, uh, test, uh, we can sort of explore that space in a very well-defined way. I think when you're, when you're thinking about it in a human setting, some classic things, you know, for example, you, it's very often that you can't control for circadian rhythms. I mean, that would be a classic, right? So you, you take blood or whatever, and you know, they, you, it's whenever it was taken, and so there's a whole circadian rhythm thing. That's going to add a piece of variance to you. Now, if you knew where it was coming from, you'd be able to factor it out. But for many cohorts, you don't have that. Going a little bit deeper, I am actually hopeful about understanding the human environment using other techniques where we try to not try to think about it as categorical measurements but as or, or dimensions but we think more about trying to map um, model kind of the all the environments around a particular human at once um, so that Oliver Stegel's work in the EMBL has done really good stuff on this so I don't think we should be depressed about the fact that modeling or measuring the human environment is so hard yeah but we should be very aware that if we don't measure it, we are not going to discover the things we want to discover. Hey, great talk. So I, I just had two quick questions. One was how you, so the, the UK Biobank starts at 40. Yeah. How do you model the, the childhood data yeah. for things like um, their yeah, chicken pox? Yeah, so there's two things about that. Uh, so they were recruited at 40 but they give permission to link to the NHS health record, and that starts in 1992. So they were recruited in between the ages of 40 and 60 in around 2005, so you can already go back to 1992. And then in the UK Biobank, they also ask, they have quite a good survey where they say, have you been diagnosed? It's not have you had. Have you been diagnosed by a doctor to have any of these diseases, and then you pick and choose them? There's a lot of evidence, actually, that that process of recall is, is reasonably good. Uh, so we actually have that going back to birth. Okay. Um, so it's kind of, it's, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do. Um, interesting enough, we didn't tell the model 
the different sources of information, but the model sort of smelt it out using a variety of ways and changed its view of the importance of a particular code, we could see that it was tuning in to the different sources of information very subtly. So it just shows you how sophisticated these models are. Yeah, that's kind of was my other question, which is, you know, if you get four diagnoses on one day, those, you, you know, like those have a, those have a sequence to them, right? And how do you manage yeah. that? Yeah, so we don't, we, we, they're actually a bag. And in fact, when they're put in by the hospital, I mean, we, we did quite a lot of digging here. Um, we really don't think there's any meaning in the sequence of how they're recorded on the day. They're just the diagnosis that happened on that day. And I think there's lots of reasons to, you know, this, this gets sent in by the hospital. They're different systems. They kind of get sorted alphabetically sometimes. Sometimes they don't. It's quite messy down there. So basically, our, our tightest granularity is one day. Right. But if something of those four things, for instance, yeah. one of them may have actually been evident for two years, and the other one may have been there for four years. How does that get? Sort yeah, of I mean, again, the model tasks that we're giving it is, here's, here's data until this point. Please predict the next data stream. Okay. So it it's trying to work out the best way to predict the future, which we hide from it in the task we train it for. Um, and uh, uh, so it's not like it can make those inferences. That's right. Um, but it's very interesting to see, A, how good it is, mm -hmm. and then B, you can ask, why did it make those inferences? And that is interesting for these, like when did the diabetes turn up? You, right. you know, did the diabetes you, you got labeled it here, but did the model think you had it before? Before, yeah. yeah. That's cool, thank you. Really interesting, uh, Ewan, and I guess you could tell this audience loves fish, but we love humans more, so <laughs> no, no. You know, a lot of questions about yeah, that no. one. Sorry, <laughs> well, there are exceptions to every rule. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll ask the obvious question, though, about Act 1. Uh, what happens if you fold in genomic data? Because uh, obviously yeah. you would hope that there's something else yeah, that would I, even I, improve your outcome. So um, we're testing that now. I don't think it's going to improve the outcome that much because I think a large amount of genetics gets expressed gets during, gets captured during your life course. And I actually think there's much more power in holding genetics out and using it as a way of asking these questions about when do we see these genetic risk factors kick in in a life course, and then using them also as a kind of holdout. It's like Mendelian randomization. So, but too many people have asked us this question, so we're going to throw it in the model. <laughs> we help. see this great, great thing about AI. You can just like chuck. Do you it. can chuck the kitchen sink in if you want. So we're going to we're going to chuck it in. But I I actually don't think it's going to going to change the predictions that much. That is my bet. Maybe for cancer. I don't think. Well, I mean, if we put rare disease genetics in, then yes, I think of course it would. Yeah, if you put the BRCA2 status in, yeah. You would that 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 would be informative. Um, I mean, I shouldn't be so skeptical, but I I do think there's many uses of genetics with this data which are not about improving prediction, and more about understanding causality. I actually think that's as important because the next question, which I'm sure someone would ask, is well. Which trajectories can we intervene and change, and which trajectories are are sort of locked? Yeah, and and we need to have some holdout data sets from the model, or we need a, or we need to work with the AI wizards about how we put in because they're kind of privileged variables, and I I'd be quite keen to get randomized control trials embedded inside of these cohorts, so we put the trials in, to the data set. You kind of spike them in. Mm -hmm. um, that would be quite cool. It would. I'd just like to point out, Francis, that Leland Ta Taylor asked the exact same question online, <laughs> which is Francis's postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> well trained. Well trained. Well trained. Awesome. I'll actually ask an Act Two question. Does the ambiguity and uncertainty about the environmental variables overall mean that we are systematically 
underestimating heritability? I think it, I am definitely, I mean, almost certainly yes. Okay, the bigger, the bigger question, which I didn't draw out there, is that the loci which were harder to discover were more dominant recessive, had more dominant recessive nature, uh, unsurprisingly, and of course more G by E. So I think there's also this thing in human genetics, it's been a bit of a head scratcher that, that we don't see a great deal of dominant recessive alleles. You, you, you really don't. Um, uh, and yet, in Mendelian genetics and in model organism genetics, you know, you can't move for dominance recessive stuff. So I do think we have a discovery problem in there, and, and that's something I'd like to, I'd, I'd really like to nail these questions down. And I probably, in my talk, I probably didn't stress enough. Unlike mice, which are very odd, laboratory mice are very odd, these Madaka fish are drawn from the wild, and their genomes represent, I mean, we've done this, their genomes really represent those wild fish. And we can go back to the same wild location and do the analogous human experiment where we fish fish out of the wild and, and, and do them. So we can really try to match what we're doing in humans, but in this, you know, this incredibly well-controlled situation rather than, than having to statistically model out uh, 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 things. Um, I have a question about the first part of your talk, especially when you mentioned zero shot. How will your model generalize for unseen diseases? Like... It won't. It won't? No, so no, no, because no. uh, it's like tokens, like the universe. We present the universe with these are your tokens. So it would be interesting to see how many shots do you need to have enough... Yeah. And accuracy I mean, acceptable. I mean, I think, yeah, maybe. Actually, one of the things about this model, it's pretty cheap to train GPU-wise. So we do training tests on our laptops. Um, and, you know, when we did the... Yeah, that. I know. I, I <laughs> Usually actually, the decoder of the transformer is the worst to train. So. Sorry? The, the, the decoder of the transformer architecture, the one that you use, it's really computational demanding. Uh, so I... I um, so I, anyway, in practice, we can just train from scratch. Okay. So I wouldn't do, I wouldn't mess with this fine tuning malarkey. Just, you know, if it's important, just train it. Thank you. Uh, so so, so that's, that's what I would do. It's, it's against what is uh, like I, large and large and boiling. I know, I know, yeah, but like I think they- have I, a foundational I, model and then we yeah, find you. I know, I know. Yeah, you propose to train from scratch. But uh, it's kind of interesting. Anshul Kunjai is in the same thing about the genome. He always trains from scratch right. as well. I think it's a, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong if you've got one of these large language models and you want to fine tune it. I, mm -hmm. I think that's fine. Yeah. You're allowed to do it. I'm not saying it's wrong. But if the problem's important, mm -hmm. don't mess around, train the right, just retrain it. Um, so, uh, so this whole fine tuning business is, is a bit weird for me. Yeah. Yeah. A, well, the token universe in words is 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 quite the embedding space is uh, it's the embedding space you need to manage the tokens, and don't forget in large language models they do all these composite tokens to do the plurals and the. BP. And the ings and the, and the, all of this, so yeah, it's, it's sort of it's, it's interesting. But we do want to go down an ICD ten level, mm -hmm. and and for that we would it would get bigger. I mean, definitely. I'm those scared big that ones. with your strategy, you are missing some trajectory that you would discover if your model was bigger. You fine tune it for what you're looking for. But yeah, thank you. Okay. So we'll take the last two minutes. I'm going to ask about fish. Yeah. Uh, these, these are great. I love those experiments. I, I was curious, well, two things. Uh, first one is the, w when you knock them out with the CRISPR and the different backgrounds and you're seeing the actually different effects. Yeah. Are you now feeding that back in and mapping for modifiers on that? Yeah, we can't. I mean, we're, we're not, that that would be another two years of fish experiments. So, so. Yeah. Plenty of money and people, yeah. right? All that. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have enough fish tank space and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But what I do want to do is, uh, we are going to do some pairwise tests with the CRISPRs. We're also going to try and, you know, I, it's like I think zebrafish. These are phenotyping the injected generation. 
Yeah? Yeah. And so we want to breed them true, and then we can cross them properly um, uh, for this. So but that's all ongoing. But my god, animal experiments. Oh. <laughs> It's yes, just I know. Timings. <laughs> and the other question is: uh, actual visible phenotypes are are hard to find uh, in that something easy and robust to map. But have you done like just across all the EQTLs for? Oh uh, yeah, so we're doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we got that. We're doing MRI, um, not um, CT scans, micro CT scans, and we have a video-based behavior assay. And so, and then we got some toxin assays as well, heartbeat with toxin. The environment is a toxin. So that's NIEHS, actually. So I'm very proud of my NIEHS um, uh, grant. Yeah. Hi, awesome talk. I have a question. Um, have you trained, for the Act 1, have you trained your models on other types of healthcare-based systems or other biobanks like Biobank Japan or like in America, yeah. our system is very different from UK Biobank? And how do you think uh, your models would stand up yeah. to different types of healthcare systems and with more variable um, genetic heritabilities yeah. or yeah. architecture as well as more variable environment? So um, two things. Firstly, we were surprised how well the zero shot test worked training in the UK and testing in Denmark. I mean, it's not obvious that that was going to work. And so we were pretty impressed by that, actually. I have no idea how it would work on a US healthcare data set. I imagine the variance inside of the data set is much higher, and I imagine you'd have to present things like hospital or system codes and, and some other things, as well as like the billing code and the ICD code, whatever. It's, it's fearsome over here. It's absolutely <laughs> fearsome. Um, I, again, I wouldn't put you off for doing it, because like you can throw, you know, so if there was a United Health person here, you know, just like, throw it all in and like train, train it. Go for it. Um, but uh, and something we'd like to do in the NHS, the UK healthcare system, is put in healthcare variables in there. I've got to do this with permission from the healthcare system. I mean, like, otherwise I'll get shot. Uh, <laughs> but, but so to try and model some of the variants that we think is coming from the healthcare system. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it, it should work. But I wouldn't, I certainly, I mean, I, you can't take the UK biobank one and use it on the UK. Like, no one dies before the age of 40. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's very much a, a, a kind of the, the training set defines the thing you can use it on. And so you really have to match your training set to your use case very carefully. Thank you. Thanks to everybody online. Thanks to everybody in person. Have a good rest of your Wednesday.